this program uh, began with President Kennedy, 1961, saying for political reasons that we were going to go to the moon before the end of the decade and return folks home safely. Not only was that a good rhetorical phrase, but for those of us who worry about program management, you might recognize that he started this program with the most important ingredients you can have. A single, simple, understandable, measurable objective. In essence, he said, go bring me a rock before I turn the calendar. If you do that, go there. That's a simple enough objective that we can all understand it, and it helps focus the whole team. And you're going to see how, unlike many of our programs, which today have quite sophisticated goals and take an awful lot of effort to try and wrap all the pieces together and satisfy all the potential constituents, it gets fuzzy, and we lose sight. Sometimes we place too much importance on on little trivial things and forget that the real objective was go bring me a rock. Uh, the beauty of this story is no one forgot that our objective was to go to the moon and come home safely. And uh, that's what they did. Now the path they took changed a little bit, but the objective never did. So what was this all about? They had eight and a half years to go from an idea to completion. They sort of knew where the moon was. They knew that it was a long ways. And they said, well, you know, if I got my car and I drove on a straight line and set it in cruise control at about 60, it would take about a half a year to get there and another half a year to come back. Assuming you just don't sleep. So it's sort of a long ways. And in order to travel that distance, we had to build an entire suite of things. When we think of the Saturn V rocket, the big seven million pound thing, about the, as long as a destroyer, it lifts off um, seven and a half million pounds of thrust. We think of that as the Apollo program. But in fact, that was just one component, that all the facilities had to be built that would construct the launch vehicles, spacecraft, all of the things necessary to prepare them. This took thousands and thousands of people who were dedicated to this same program. The nice thing was it was such an exciting goal that everybody wanted to play. And if you put an ad in the paper and said you needed someone to work on your program, you had a line around the block. Uh, and no one even asked what you're going to pay because it was the kind of thing that if you could be allowed to, to work on this program, that's all you wanted. So we were very fortunate in that regard. The people that put this thing together, guess how old they were? The average age. 25. Okay. The, the 25 to 26 range is about where the average workforce was. Our leaders were early to mid-30s. We thought if anybody was 35, you should get them a cane and a, and a wheelchair. <laughs> so that's the kind of people who went to work on it. How did we go to work on it? Well, we had to build several spacecraft. We had to figure out this mission. And in those days, our flight computers were 18K. Seems a little bit shy if you want to go to the moon, doesn't it? But that's about where we were. In fact, just as an aside, when we built the shuttle, we stepped up all the way to 32K. <laughs> and had a debate of uh, great intensity about going on from 32 to 64. So the, the, the world has come a long way since this early start. But it's amazing what you can do with the tools you have when that's all you have. So we built in rocket engines, life support systems, radios, all those things were put together, tested, and brought ready to flight. 
And so when it came time to go fly a mission, they did something interesting. In the movie, you may recall seeing all these people sitting around consoles and there were screens. And, and we had divided the control center up so that you had people assigned to a discipline. There'd be someone who did, uh, we called him an ECOM, Electrical Communications and ECS. Uh, somebody else did the communicate, uh, the, the lunar module stuff, someone else did the CSM stuff. We had two teams. One that would work the lunar module and one that would work the CSM when we were in lunar orbit. The whole idea of this mission was we were going to start on the Earth, we would lift off uh, with a Saturn V, make about one to one and a half laps around the Earth to check out all the spacecraft systems. Then we would fire the engine again to start it on a trajectory. It doesn't really go to the moon, but it goes to an apogee that will allow the moon to fly into its sphere of influence and capture the, capture the spacecraft and change the trajectory. So it starts out, and now we're going 36,000 feet per second. It's kind of fast. And it, it will go, and it'll go all the way. You're 240,000 miles out to the moon. As it gets close, the moon's gravity, while weak, is enough to capture the spacecraft, and so it'll change the trajectory. And then, if you do nothing, you'll fly past the moon, turn around and come back, in what we call a free return trajectory. That allowed you to go to, and come back and re enter the atmosphere without doing anything if you lost propulsion. <clears throat> when you get to the moon, if everything looks good, you're going to fire your engine and slow down. So now we must slow down to something like 6,000 feet per second, which is the orbital speed around the moon, and they go, go into the orbit around the moon. And they'll turn around and reverse the process to come home. So that's the general strategy. When it came time to go, we put the teams together, and we had flight crews would practice in simulators of, that look like, on the, on the inside they look like spacecraft, and the outside they look like big boxes. Uh, the control center inside looked just like the control center that you flew from because it was the same. It was only that we fed it with data coming from a simulated environment. And they would practice with different mission phases. We'd start with launch, launch aboards, and we would do some rendezvous and dockings and translunar ejections. Each phase of the flight would get practice, the lunar descent, the lunar ascent, Rendezvous in order. They were generally in, in four to eight hour chunks of simulation where you go through and exercise all the procedures. The idea was that we would get used to talking to each other, know the checklist, the mission rules that were pertinent to that phase of flight, and they go on. Now that's not terribly different than the way you check out a lot of your programs and things. <clears throat> but they put in one other little element. The fellows, a position called the simulation supervisor. What the simulation supervisor did was to mess up the game. They would have a script that said, we're going to go do this sequence of events. We'll start here, we're going to go to the end. Well, as the team became proficient at doing that, there was no reason to keep practicing that. So then the sim supervisor would go in and start putting in false. And you'd start out with a simple thing like the valve didn't open, the, the battery's dead. Things that were really obvious that you could just work around and say, what equipment do I have that would work around this? But as people became proficient at that, you wouldn't want them to be bored, so then we would start compounding them so that with you'd have a failure early in the mission that was easy to wrap work around and it would sit there and, and then they'd come along with a failure in another system perhaps that would make that first failure very critical and if you hadn't properly reconfigured or taken the appropriate safeguards you can get in trouble now simulation supervisor is sitting at the t in a little booth in, like a sports announcer's booth at the top of the control center 
and he's got a team, and they're listening to all the conversations going on between the players and the team, between their back rooms, what they're telling them, because each of these positions had several people in the back rooms who were feeding them data. So he would listen to that. And if you came up and made a good guess and said, oh, it's, it's that piece of equipment that's bad. Well, that might have been what he did, but listening, he knows you just guessed. You didn't check to see if it was this or could it have been a bad piece of instrumentation or something else. So these simulation supervisors were selected because they had no morals and scruples. <laughs> and so, well, they just changed the script in real time so that at the end, you had to go around the room and they'd start, when the simulation was over, they'd start at one end and everybody had to say, here's what I saw, here's what I did and why I did it. And then you go on to the next position and everybody went through this. And when it came to the point where you said, well, I know that this thing happened, this, this was a faulty unit, and the simulation the supervisor's boss, very interesting, but you know what we really failed was this thing over here. It's got the same signature if you don't check it. And so now somebody's embarrassed, and you really don't like to do that with your friends. So over time, these games became more and more intense, and they created an environment, that even though it was a simulation, people leaving that room and at the end of the simulation they would be ringing wet. No mission, including Apollo 13, ever left people quite as uptight as some of these simulations because they were really good at it. So that's how we got ready. You might think about how you check out your, your designs. We do things like Monte Carlo, Carlo runs to make sure we have an overlook combinations and things. But when you put people in the system, they do funny things that you wouldn't ever design to. As an engineer, we go through and we check that we've looked at all of the limits, we've done all of the things that we think of as something that would get broken or, or could be misused our system. But humans can think of all kinds of crazy things they would do with our systems that we never imagined. And that's the hard part to flush out. So these simulations really did that well. So as we worked on this, getting ready to go fly, we worked 24-7 to get this, get ready. Uh, we really thought there really was nothing that could get in our way. And that's almost true. Uh, the last couple of weeks before flight, uh, or actually a couple of months, we took the flight crew down to the Cape and we lived there. Uh, just stayed on the, on the base and worked from there. And so, uh, one of the things that we did after you've flown these simulations in the daytime and studied and done other stuff in the evenings, you uh, look for things to do to break the, the environment. And one of the things that I did was I started going out to the launch pad. Now, they trained us to look at spacecraft, they trained us to do all kinds of stuff. Uh, they really didn't tell us anything about the launch pad. We're only going to be with it for a matter of hours. Getting to orbit would take 10, 12 minutes. And going to the moon took another six minutes of burn and some coast in between. There really was much, not much we could do about it. So we just said, hey, uh, you don't need to know that. We'll train you to do other things. Well, I thought it would be kind of interesting just to know what this little critter looked like. And so I started going out after dinner every night would go out to the launch pad and started at the bottom. And the launch pad turns out to be, it's an industrial site. There's cables on the ground, there's pipes, there's plumbing, there's noise everywhere, people are shouting to each other because it's noisy, there's pumps running. It's a construction site. And, and so it was kind of awkward to climb around, you had to climb over different things. And so, after I had done this for several evenings, I got way up to the top where the rocket starts coning down, where the lunar module stacks. The big rocket was generally a cylinder, and then at the top was a little cone, and then the command module sits up on the top. And just where that cone starts, there's a 
a unit we call the instrument unit. Not quite tall enough to stand up in. It's about 33 feet in diameter, and there's really nothing to see in it. And so I got up there that night, and I looked around, and I was about to turn away, and I noticed that there was an access hatch that was open, and there was a light inside, so I went over there and crawled inside and startled this poor technician. And my first job then was to get him not to call security. It was okay to be there. After he came down, then he, he started showing me what he's doing, and he took me around the inside of this cylinder, and he says, tonight I've got this thing on Bob, it's up here in this box, and what you call it here, and a, a old gadget over here. I'm going to hook them all up and put them on my trace, and I'm going to record the signals, and we're going to compare them with proper output to make sure they're properly hooked up. And I said, well, that's, that's pretty neat. So I left, and he said, before you go, uh, I have something I'd like to tell you. Okay, why? Well, what's that? He said, well, I don't really know how you get to the moon. Well, I said, a big deal. This is a big program. It's hard. It's difficult to uh, any one person to grasp it all. But there's a lot of people here that know what they're doing. And he said, okay, but if you get there, I'm not sure how you're going to get back. <laughs> well, at that point, he had a little more of my attention. <laughs> and, and, and then he said, you know... I don't understand all this, but I will tell you one thing. It won't fail because of me. Now he had my total attention. It won't fail because of me. You get thousands of people who think that way, you're, you're going somewhere. So I never forgot that, and I have called that incident the spirit of Apollo, although it exists in lots of places. You've run into them in other places too. But armed with that, we're ready to go fly. Uh, it turns out for, I was uh, potentially exposed to measles, and so a little before flight, they uh, took me off the crew and sent Jack Swagger in my place. And uh, at this point, you can go back to the movie. I think Gary Sidney's character. When I watched that movie, I decided when I grew up, I wanted to be Gary Sinise. That guy was really cool. <laughs> but you know what? He had a scene in there where he was feeling sorry for himself about being removed from flight. And i got to tell you, he gave an absolutely amateur performance. <laughs> now, I gave an Oscar winning Sure. I was feeling sorry for myself. So when it came time to launch, I didn't have anything to do. I literally was sitting on the steps in the control center because it wasn't any place for me and watching them. And I watched them come out and go out to the launch pad and, and they came out in their suits. And I could imagine having been on the launch pad when it was an industrial site. Now it's not an industrial site. It's silent. There's nothing there. Inside your suit, there's nothing to hear except the whir of a little cooling pump that circulates the air. You climb up, you see the side of this thing coated with ice, and sometimes uh, when the sun shifts, uh, big chunks of ice will fall down, and they go whoop down to the bottom and splash, and don't make a sound because you're isolated from it. It's really a, 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 a out of this world kind of scene. And this thing just looks like it's, it's a live animal and it's just waiting to spring. They lift off. I know what they're looking at. You see this thing build up the G's and that first stage takes this 7 million pound vehicle and gets up to about 5.5 G's going just about straight up. That thing is so big and so powerful that when the engines shut down, all of this metal in the first stage has been compressed. The second stage and the other stage up front are all just as they were. So when this thing relaxes, it's going to relax around the CG, which is over here. So what this does is up in the cockpit, where you've been getting pushed at 5Gs, 
all of a sudden, when those engines stop, this thing relaxes and you go bump, and you hit your head on the instrument panel. <laughs> going the wrong way. And that was not uh, something that people were expecting to have happen. You get out on it, and the first thing you realize is you get out of the seat and you float around, and it's like you've been there all your life. I think we all worry about would you adapt, and the answer is, oh, it should take a nanosecond or two. And it's just like you have been there, everything seems normal, until you go over and look out the window. You look out the window, and they got the most beautiful visuals. There's not a plasma screen around that can make visuals like that. When you see the world running by underneath you, and there's essentially no sound. Spacecraft is basically electronic, so it, it has few inverter sounds, a little fan, but it's essentially quiet, and the world's just passing by. For those of you that are aviators, uh, you may have seen thunderstorms, and if you have, you were cautioned to never, ever go near one of those. They're bad news. Now you look down at these things, and they're cute. <laughs> they, they look like popcorn. They, little things that stick up and they go flash. Poof, poof. And it's just really interesting. In fact, if, if you find places, you will see a thunderstorm go off over here and it'll set off a chain reaction where once that's off the next one and they just click their way. Some of those chains have been marked, uh, measured at uh, like a thousand miles. And where are the biggest ones? In the deserts of Africa. The aerosol in the air it's, and no moisture just makes a static discharge. It's really spectacular. But it's time to get on with life and leave there. Uh, the horizons, uh, you get a sunrise every 90 minutes and a sunset. For those of us who like to sit out on the beach or Late, just watch the sunrise and sunset anywhere. You ain't seen nothing yet until you see that what it looks like going around the earth, where you have these vibrant colors of brilliant reds and orange and blue, and then our little friendly thunderstorms that stick up there. It's absolutely spectacular. You never get tired of it. But it's time to go to the moon, and they go off and do that. They accelerate up to this. 36,000 feet per second. Then they go out and now they're coasting. A day out, they make a maneuver. It's a tiny little maneuver with their service module engine that is going to move their trajectory so that they can reach the landing site at Fromaro. It's a small maneuver. But if you don't do your maneuver behind the moon, you will not be on this free return trajectory I told you about earlier. You do this after you've seen all your, your spacecraft systems work and you make the maneuver with the engine that's going to be used to bring you home. So if it doesn't work, they're probably not going to get in trouble and that, that's a pretty good strategy. They did that. That evening they're getting ready to go into the lunar module and turn it on and they want to open this thing up and show you a picture. And they did that at the end of this, I'm sitting there watching them, and boy, it was really getting hard to take. I thought surely they'd need some help, they didn't need any help at all. And so the show came to an end, it was time for us to go to the night shift. We had four flight control teams. We needed four because when the two vehicles were separated in lunar orbit, you needed one to manage the CSM and one to manage the lunar module on the surface team. And since we had to run the spacecraft 24-7, then we had to run shifts, and we would try to coordinate the shift change so it took place at some convenient time. Like the crew's getting ready to go to bed, so we were getting ready to put the crew to bed. The next team coming in was had a flight director, his name was Glenn Lunny. Gene Kranz, the guy that wore the white vest in the movie, and probably the only one in the movie that really came across in, in mannerisms and personalities like the real player. He was getting ready to take his team off, and I was sitting back in the back, 
just waiting to go out and do something to get this out of my head, when we heard him say, we've got a problem. And all of a sudden, the world changed. Now, what was the first thing that happened? Well, fortunately, we had two teams in play, and we were very careful to make sure one of them's in charge and one is watching, just to keep from getting ourselves any more confused than necessary. <clears throat> so, Kranzik's team is still on, and Glenny's team is up there, but now they're getting a first-hand turnover of what actually happened. And so they do this, and they watch it, and what do you hear? Well, this well-oiled team that couldn't be stopped says, hmm, flight, I, uh, I think we have an instrumentation problem. We have all these red lights on the consoles. And we went around, and they looked for every possible explanation other than something catastrophic had just happened. Now, we can all identify with that. You're driving down the road, and you get involved in an auto accident. We all think time kind of slows down and stops. You see it, but you, you do everything possible to make it not be real. And so this wonderful team spent some time in real denial, trying to do everything imaginable to explain that it really hadn't happened. Finally, Kranz looked over at the Econ and he said, Sign. When was the last time you saw instrumentation spewing a whole bunch of stuff out in the sky? So I don't. Okay. So now we go into the next phase. We turn this over on the team ship. Glenn Lunny comes in. Gene Kranz takes his team and they go off to go figure out what's going on. Glenn Lonnie comes in and he's got this group of people that are kind of all standing around and figuring out what to do. And he goes and says, find out what's the shortest time we can come back for you. It's all the gas we have. How much water do we have? Uh, could we do this? He, he went through and he gave every single person that was in the room a question. And, to this day, I believe he didn't really think about what the question was. It was just give everybody something purposeful to do so that we get our thought processes back to work. And in nothing flat, this team came back to that level of proficiency that we've come to know. And they started working on it. Now, where are we? Well, we've quickly deduced we've lost our oxygen in the service module. That oxygen is needed to breathe. It's needed to mix with hydrogen to make water. And without electricity, which comes out of our fuel cells, you can't control the engine or do any navigation or fire anything. Uh, so we have a spacecraft that is essentially dormant. We have no propulsion capability right now. And we're working on what's left of the oxygen, which is playing out, and we have a, only a, a, maybe an hour or so worth of time to do something. So you do triage on the first day. Somebody says, hey, you remember we had a simulation once where we put the crew in the, in the lunar module because of some problem in the service module? And we sealed it off so that they could breathe a good environment while we depressurized the command module to get rid of some toxic gas or something. They said, let's do that. So they told Fredo, we're thinking about Lem Lifeboat, which is what we call this thing. He said, yeah, I'm with you. And he runs off. Lovell says, Fredo, what, what is that? He said, we're going to power out the lunar module. And Jim said, how long does that take? So that's about six hours on the checklist. Jim rightfully thought, I don't think we got that much. Well, Fredo got it done because he knew that checklist absolutely cold. He got it done all by himself in about an hour and a half. And we were able to secure the rest of the service module and the CM so we didn't drain its batteries. Now that's important because there are a couple of little batteries in the CM. That's the little pointed capsule. 
That's the thing you come home in. And it's got a couple of little batteries in there that you need from the time you separate and come into the atmosphere till you get on the water and then long enough for someone to come and get you. So these two little batteries are really, really important. And we want to be very careful not to drain them. So they were able to do that. Jack shut down everything in the command module, in the service module. Everybody jumps in the lunar module and says, okay, here we are. Now we remember we're on a trajectory that is not coming back into the atmosphere. And so we don't have enough oxygen. We don't have consumables to, to get back, we don't think. But we're not coming back. So step one, they, the Lenny's team says, all right, we need to do something. We better cut off everything that uses electricity to save, save what we've got so we don't run out. At this point, all, these, all this gas that's coming out of the service module looks like stars. So if they're trying to take a sighting on stars to a line platform, you're not going to be able to do it. You won't be able to recognize it. And so they follow a principle that says don't ever get in the way of success. We love to turn off all this equipment, but we don't dare until we have an inertial reference in the lunar module so we can navigate to know how to make subsequent maneuvers. So we ate the cost from an electrical point of view of keeping that stuff alive in order to ensure that we would be able to do something. And they finally got that done, and then they computed uh, a maneuver that would get them back on a free return. So Lunny's team does this with the ground, or with the flight crew guys. They work this all out, and now they're on a trajectory that is going to go around behind the moon, but it is going to come back and meet entry conditions on the Earth. Okay, that's good. Well, it, but the landing site will be in the Atlantic, and our recovery forces are in the Pacific. Uh, don't feel bad, we're coming to the right planet. <laughs> and so, we take another step. Meanwhile, Kranz has got his folks all clustered downstairs, and they're trying to figure out, what do we do now? And they start out and they prioritize their list. What is it we have to do to get home? Someone else makes a catalog of the resources available. And then we look at the timeline because it's based on going around the moon when you have an opportunity to maneuver and other things like you're going to hit the Earth's atmosphere at this time, whether you like it or not. Now, in between, what decision points do we have to reach and how do we do it? So they worked on this thing and they got into this, uh, let's call it an animated discussion. <laughs> Some people said, you know, this has been God, a terrible day. We should take all the fuel we have in these two vehicles, turn around, burn it all, and come home and get on the ground. So it all says, you're right, it's been a terrible day. Don't touch anything. We don't know what we're doing. We don't haven't thought it through. It's just cooler. I said, but we don't have enough resources to get home. We'll figure that out. Just don't mess it up right now. After they did this, they came to the conclusion that what we would do was go around behind the moon and make a little maneuver. It wasn't going to bring them home any sooner, but it was going to put them in the Pacific Ocean next to the recovery forces. So we're making more progress. Now, to get home, that's a little different. You have to take and take all the electrical power in the lunar module and turn it off for everything except a radio and a fan that would circulate the air. And if we did that, we could hold the battery consumption down to a level where they could make it back home. Now, the CSM's already been powered down. And it's a little freezing, you can tell, because when you exhale, your breath goes out and hits the skin, and now you have a coat of ice there. So it's getting pretty cold over there, and now we're about to take this power off. 
But after you have stabilized the situation and you have a path that comes home, the next step in this crisis management was, okay, we're going to have to do something drastic. And so it says, yeah, we're, we're going home. And what does it say? It says, turn off everything. Uh, you don't want to do that. Yeah, we do. And so these poor folks are left with nothing to do but shiver for a while. That's what they think. Now, Gene Kranz's group over here and is trying to figure out, okay, we were successful in removing all the power. Now, in another couple of days, we've got to power it back up. Well, how do you do that? Well, normally that's about a week's process as you power these things up where you check everything and do everything as best and thoroughly as you can. And you try your best to make sure everything's right. Everybody's got instrumentation and they agree that their piece is ready to go. And a young fellow named John Aaron uh, took over this job and he was just going around and getting everybody organized as they tried to figure out how they could power it up. And John says, look, you know, this is how much power we have. There isn't any more. You don't get any more. And it says, here's all the rest of it. We've got to figure out how to get power in a spacecraft in a useful way at the right time. Those were some uh, other uh, animated conversations. But finally, they got this all together. And as a matter of fact, we had a, we were, in those days, we still had computer readouts that came not on fancy little screens, but on script charts. And this pile of computer printer, we, we just grabbed a whole bunch of that, put it on the table, and started writing the procedure. And with everybody that had an input into it, all working on it. And this went on for several days as they worked, especially with people out in the field. Factories would call us and say, we have some guys looking at this, and maybe you can do something. And one of our big worries was that we, we didn't know if the inertial unit would come back to life or not. <coughs> it was below freezing. Well, we went to great pains to make sure this inertial unit, which was the heart of all of our guidance, stayed between 70 and 70 and a half degrees. Because that's where it was at. Well, it's clearly not there. And we've done thermal testing, certainly. We tested it all the way to 72 to 68. <laughs> because that was way out of spec, right? Well, we didn't make that either. And nobody knew what to do with this thing. Well, some brave young technician went into his boss and says, Boss, I, I heard that you're worried about whether the IMU will come back to life after it's been cold. He said, I want to tell you, we had a, an ice storm last year and and he told everybody to go home, and I did. And I left one of those in the back of the station wagon. And when I came back the next day, I didn't want to tell anybody, so I drove it over and put it on the lab and left it there. I do know it worked when I tested it. So all of a sudden, it's whew, good show. Things like that were happening all over the country as we put this thing together. You know the story in flight that they started getting more caution lights when they look around and it says the CO2 is getting too high. And it was a problem with the, we'd used up all of the lithium hydroxide that we used to extract the CO2 from the cabin gases. And we had a whole bunch of them in the CSM, but they were little bricks are about that long and so bigger. Where and the lunar module used the disk that was about that big and about like this, so the two weren't compatible. And they didn't know what to do since they'd used up all I had. Again, the control center guy says, You know, you remember once we did a simulation where we had simulated that we could not get the fans to blow air through the through the lithium hydroxide, and we figured out a way to take some plastic bags and tape them together into a manifold and blow air through it with, a, with what in the CSL was a vacuum cleaner. He said, we go over the lunar module and take it to the suit loop and blow it through there. So they did that. Here they go. They tell the guys what to do. They fix it. CO2 levels come down. 
everybody's happy. Well, Lenny Steve isn't quite through yet because oh, the trajectory is drifting off and all that we did to get back on the free return looks like it's drifting away. So we have to figure out a way to get them back. But now they have no computer and no inertial units, no references. And people said, you know, it really isn't that hard. We do precision because we have precision. But you don't have to. Here's what's good enough. We've practiced this in simulators. We said, yeah, we all know how to do that. So they go and do it. So they make mid-course correction. Actually, they made two of them on the way home. So now we're all through. We've got the stack of paper. Unlike the movie, we didn't go over to a simulator and do everything by trial and error. We said a team of people who knew nothing whatsoever about what we had done, but were familiar with the spacecraft, had them run it through the simulator to make sure it was all coming together and red line the mistakes we might have made. Because we were all tired and didn't know if we were speaking English or not. We went off, got a shave and shower, and came back, read out the procedures. And you know all the rest. Turned out it, it worked. They came down. They hit the atmosphere. You know, in that little spacecraft. Here they've been floating around. They finally got it powered up. It's still cold, but it seems to be running. They, they got an alignment using the moon and the sun as their references, where we normally use very sophisticated geometries with stars. That was good enough. And they came along and they said, you know, we're about to hit the atmosphere. I sure hope we're pointing in the right direction. And that little blunt heat shield was out there. And finally it starts to rock just a little bit as they pick up a little bit of atmosphere and it starts to slow down. And the little tongues of, of gas go around it. And when you hit the, when you hit not very many molecules of air, there's not much air out there in space. But when you hit them at 36,000 feet per second, they get angry anyhow. And so you get this glow. And if you could imagine yourself sitting inside a gas stove and looking from the inside out and watching this, you start seeing these little tongues of flame as they come around the side of the spacecraft and the accelerations pick up and you now get pushed in your seat. And you're going backwards and it pushes harder and these little tongues of flame come around you and they get whiter and whiter and whiter until it's so bright that you have to put your hand over the window if you want to read the instrument panel. Then that all backs off. The flames go away. Eventually the parachutes come out and, and there's a great deal of relief as you saw in the movie. The movie captured the idea of our home free Look at that. They did a wonderful job of releasing emotions. So, if you remember the spirit of Apollo, it won't fail because of me, and you enlist thousands of people to help you do that. And if you get a team that works like Bernie King in World War II said, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. You can go 240,000 miles, you can have a catastrophic event, and you can turn around, with homework and teamwork, you can live to fly another day. That's what you guys do. That's where we are today. And from all of us, we say good luck. You got the lead. We got hard days ahead of us, and you're equipped to take care of it. Thank you very much. Good luck.